verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Um, today is our 21st day of the 60-day journey of walking in the light. It was 21 days ago that I asked this congregation for all of us to just to take a few minutes each day to read the Word of God, to each day uh, turn to a portion of Psalms and, and, and chew on the bread of life. And, and so if you're a guest here or if you've been gone for the last several weeks, we have notebooks, little brown notebooks on the back table. I've just restocked them this morning. And in those brown notebooks is an insert with a list of scriptures for each day for 60 days. Um, it, it, even if you're just visiting here, I would encourage you to take one. And if you weren't here, I would encourage you to take one. And that we could all walk into greater levels of God's light as we just take a little bit of truth in each day as we take a few moments to ponder the word of God and then to write down um, a few bullet points. What is God speaking to us? Um, what, is in our bringing, he, what is he bringing to our minds? What did the, the word of God say and how might, we, uh, how might we have experienced that in our lives and how might we apply it in our lives today and tomorrow? And so if, if you're just getting started, um, if you're just getting that notebook and that list, don't start at the very beginning of Psalms. Start it with the date that is today's date, the scripture reading for today, because there's something powerful as we as a body start to march in unison and unity that we, we're all speaking the same speak and reading from the same scriptures. And as Pastor Schumacher preached Wednesday night, the word of God will not return void. As we speak it, as we read it, as we consume it, it will accomplish what God's will is for us. And it is happening. I, I, I'm just receiving testimony after testimony of how God is shining the light. And as he shines the light in us, it will just naturally shine out. 60 days of walking in the light. It's not too late to start. And so this morning, as we continue our series of walking in the light, reading from 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, This then is the message that which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and that in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if, big if, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You're here this morning, no doubt, because you want to walk with him. Because as Jesus Christ walks in the light, we follow after his example and we too then live our lives patterned after him walking in the light and just like first john chapter one proclaims that god is light there is no way to have a relationship with god except we step into the light because god is light it is impossible to not step into the light in our relationship with god and similarly first peter chapter one verse 16 makes a very similar proclamation that says god is holy therefore be holy like he is holy first peter 1 and 16 says it is written be holy for I am holy. There is no separating God from holiness, just like there is no separating God from light. If you step into the light, you step into God. If you step into God, you step into holiness. There is no way except to walk in the light of holiness. And this morning, God would like to shed some light on what it means to walk in holiness. You may be seated. The word of God is, is filled overflowing with proclamations related to the importance of holiness. God called unto himself a holy nation. He set aside a holy priesthood. He established a holy Sabbath, and he prescribed holy sacrifices to be done on a holy mount in a holy temple. The tabernacle just didn't have a holy place. It, it had to have a holy of holies as well. And because God himself is a holy God, therefore he has called us to be holy like unto himself. If you want a relationship with God, there is no relationship except you have a relationship with his holiness. We must settle in our hearts and our minds that there, there is an expectation from God that we live our lives walking in holiness. This is not an optional thing that we, we add on as an accessory. Holiness is not a, a thing to consider. It is our walk with God. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. It's not an optional thing. It's not a, a level of commitment. It is the beginning of 
our walk with God, as we're born again, born of the water, born of the Spirit, we are made holy like unto him. But throughout the ages, mankind has tried to reframe holiness as something that's optional, something you should consider and and you might do. Even from the very beginning of the New Testament church, holiness was challenged. In Acts chapter 6, we don't have to turn there, but in verses 3 and 3 through 5, the, the Bible names Nicholas of Antioch as being chosen as one of the seven leaders of business matters of the early church. He was selected as a leader of this recently birthed church because the Bible says that he was a man of faith who was full of the Holy Ghost. He's, he's named along with uh, those like Stephen. But according to history, Nicholas's decision or dedication to the apostolic message was somewhat short-lived. He started in the right place, but he didn't finish strong. Nicholas eventually backslid and introduced the doctrine of the Nicolaeans to the church. This doctrine was perhaps a a reaction to legalism of many newly converted Jews. You see, uh, the, the first church was Jewish. Jewish converts, it wasn't until later that the Gentiles received the same message that we are now a part of. And, and those Jews who lived by the law, well, they had, they had a framework that was very rigid and strict. Here's what we do, here's what we don't do. Here's what we eat, here's what we don't eat. Here's the way we do things, and here's the ways we don't things. Here's the ways we dress. And, and so as, as they were converted into this New Testament church, born of the Spirit, born of the water, um, we see evidence of this in Scripture as, as there's many times the Word of God addresses them saying, no, 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 you're, you're not under the law anymore. Yes, the, the, the moral law still apply. You, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't lie, but you, you don't have to bring a sacrifice. You don't have to do this and this and this. There. So there, there's a struggle going on between a, a framework that was rigid under the law and the, the revelation of Jesus Christ and the, the grace of God and the salvation, this gift that he extends us through his blood that um, doesn't require all those things in the same way. And now there's conflict of sorts. And so perhaps the doctrine of the Nicolaeans was somewhat a, of a knee-jerk reaction to some of the legalism that was going on in, in the newly converted Jews. But the, regardless of the reasons why, the, the message swung too far as they manipulated um, God's grace into a message of false freedom as he declared that since they were all sinners saved by grace, Christians could live like the world on the outside and be saved on the inside. We know this is to be something similar as to once saved, always saved, uh, another false doctrine. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, John compared the Nicolaeans and this doctrine to Balaam in the Old Testament who cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. The stumbling block that he's referencing was, that was cast before the children was the mixing of godliness and worldliness. And in doing so, the people of God circumvented the protection of God and the people of God cursed themselves from within and because they couldn't be attacked from without. See, God puts a hedge of protection around us, but if we, if we mix the world with the spirit, well, we, we lose that protection. Since Nicholas's teaching required no real outward change, or any change, in fact, to be saved, he and his followers attracted a whole lot of converts, uh, people from both pagan religions and those lukewarm churches. His message to the apostolic believers was, we live in, why well, live in a legalistic life of bondage, of holiness and sanctification, like the apostles taught, when you can be free in Jesus? You know, when I take a step back, I guess not much has changed. Some things continue to be the same. That message still prevails itself today. Why why restrict yourself to the Word of God when you can just be free and the grace of God be received without any actual commitment, without any actual steps of obedience? And it's no different that this man, Nicholas, who was once named among the seven full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, like many men, great men and women, have taken the holy out of Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God in them. And as history will tell us, if you follow any version of these false doctrines that remove the, the need to be holy like he is holy, the removal of holiness will always lead to the erosion of truth because God is holy. 
And as we, the removal of holiness takes place in any doctrine, soon there's no more oneness, no more revelation of the mighty God in Christ, and no holiness quickly turns into no more water baptism in the name of Jesus. No holiness will result in no longer needing to be born of the Spirit as it's an optional gift that you might have. Or Everything becomes optional when you start to remove the foundation. You, you can't separate God from holiness except you separate yourself from God. The word of God has not changed and God has called his people out of darkness into light to be holy like he is holy. My friends, holiness is not optional because without it, no man, no woman shall see the Lord. Proverbs 23 and 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. This, this precious gift we've been given, this access, this understanding we need, church, we need to take a stand and defend it at times because there is a prevalent spirit in this world that says, well, let's just mix a little bit of this with a little bit of that, and it will still sound right, and some of it will be right, but it won't actually protect us and deliver us like God intended. We risk losing all truth when we start to let holiness not be a thing. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me next to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. As God has called us out of darkness into his light to, to walk in holiness, the word of God has made it very plain to explain what it means to live a life that is walking in holiness. We read one of these examples here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, or in verse 14. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? You can't mix light and dark. You're either one or the other. Don't be yoked up means to, to don't couple yourself or obligate yourself with an unbeliever. Don't be yoked together or have fellowship with one that is not equal in their belief. Don't be yoked together in marriage between a Christian and a non-Christian. Verse 15 goes on to say, And what concord or what agreement hath Christ with Satan? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel or an enemy of the church? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. We're walking in the light. We're walking in holiness. You cannot separate holiness from God and have a relationship with God. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So how does one walk in holiness? How, how, does, how do we actually do that? Well, I'm glad you asked because verse 17 answers that question. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. To be holy unto God is to simply be set apart unto God, to separate ourselves from the world, to walk in a direction away from those things that, that once had us bound, the sins in our life that we so easily took us captive to walk in a direction away from those things towards God, to set ourselves apart for God, to walk in a direction towards God. Continue to read in the next verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, noting there, there was no chapter in the letter that was written to the church at Corinth that says, Now, have, therefore, having these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, perfecting is not a destination, it's a direction, isn't it? You see, God wants to make you more perfect today than you were yesterday, than you were last week. Because holiness is not a destination we walk to. Holiness is a destination we walk in. A direction. Perfecting holiness is a process, not a checklist. There's a lot of confusion in Christianity at large about what exactly is holiness, oftentimes popular culture will label holiness as legalism. And to be fair, I'm sure there's occasions where some of what they're implying was true that because man has a way of exchanging relationship for religion and creating form and structure that, that isn't God's form and structure. But true holiness is not a checklist of things. True holiness is the result of the one true God taking up residency in us and we become holy as he is holy. 
separated unto God so that he can start a remodeling project that will continue or should continue as long as we have breath. And every time, not just some of the times, but every time God fills an individual, when he takes up residency in this temple made without hands, when we're filled with the Spirit of God as evidenced by speaking in tongues, God's Spirit will always reproduce a greater degree of God in us when it's exercised. And a life that is ever lived in their, our walk and commitment to God will ever become more like God, his divine nature engrafted into our nature. So how does one start their walk in the light of holiness? Holiness starts when we make ourselves available to God through our obedience to the word of God, which will always reproduce God in us. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. When we make ourselves available to God, when we take steps to conform to the word of God and obedience to his direction for our lives, we make our bodies a living sacrifice and it becomes holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'll say it again. God wants to make you more holy today than you were yesterday, than you were last week. Because holiness is not a destination. Holiness is a direction that we walk in. Turn with me next, if you would, to Jude, starting in verse 17. Jude 17 says, there's two opposing directions that we can walk in. Jude chapter seven, or Jude seven, verse seventeen says, "But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust." That's the wrong direction. These be they who separate themselves. Who are they separating themselves from? From God, because God is holy. Be holy as God is holy because you cannot have a relationship with God except God's holiness be involved in it. So these walking in the wrong direction separate themselves from who? They separate themselves from God's being sensual, not having the spirit. That's a direction that walks opposing the direction of holiness. Verse 20 says, But ye beloved, here's how you ensure that you continue to walk in the right direction, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Where does holiness come from? It comes from obeying the word of God, building ourselves up in most holy faith. Well, what exactly does that mean? Praying in the Holy Ghost. I, just, I need to read that again. Here's how you build yourselves up. But ye, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, speaking words in a language that you never learned, builds you up, produces God in you in ways that you can't produce God in you. It's simple obedience. Well, how often should I pray in the Holy Ghost? You should pray every day. You should allow the Spirit of God to speak to you as often as you can. And what will that do? What what will that simple act of obedience produce? Verse 21, it will keep yourselves in the love of God. It will keep you walking in the right direction, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Church, God wants to reproduce more of himself in you today than was produced in you yesterday than was last week because holiness is not a destination. Holiness is a direction we walk in. Now, before service, I I recruited a few volunteers to help me with this next illustration as we're going to act out a parable for you live. Not... I guess you are the studio audience. That would be the live audience, yes. A live studio audience. And we're we're reading from Matthew chapter 20. And so if if the screen, if you could put Matthew chapter 20, starting verse 1 up there. I've uh, recruited some very hard workers, some very diligent people. And so as we set the stage for this little drama, this little skit, reading from... Verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder when he went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So I'm going to play the role of the the householder who's looking for some laborers. And so 
if I could get one of my volunteers to come, Brother Kumar, I'd like to hire you to work in the vineyard today. I know it's early, but, but you're a hard worker. You're used to getting up early. You're standing here, and so um, it's a done deal. You're hired. Now, this is, church, this is the place all of us start when we are born again, when we're born of the water, born of the Spirit. We are all hired into the kingdom of God. We all become laborers for Christ. And we all start in the same place. Washed in his blood, born of the Spirit, holy, sanctified unto God, made separate unto God. We've made ourselves available. We conformed. We repented at an altar. We, we are now in. We've been hired. We've been accepted. And we all start in the exact same place. A baby. Reborn. And so if this is our starting place, right, we're gonna, this side of the building, let's say that side of the building, those doors are um, the ending place. If, if, we're, if, we, if we get there, we're perfect like God. We'll never actually get there, but we're mo moving in a direction towards it at all times. And so it says, and when he agreed with the laborers, can't read with the pillar in the way. And when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into the vineyard. You've been hired. Why don't you take a few steps forward? It's early in the day. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing aisle in the marketplace. Do I have a couple more laborers? W would you join me in the field today? Yeah. I'll pay you a fair wage. Very good. And he said to them, go also into the into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give to you. And they went on their way. And again, he went out about the sixth hour. Okay, time is going by, guys. You're, you're moving forward. The clock is ticking a little further forward. Come on. Hours have gone by. We started early. I don't know. Um, let's say we started at, well, if it's the sixth hour, we might have started at 4 a.m. I'm not sure what the sixth hour is relative to our clock, but Brother Kumar, you started at 4 a.m. Then we had somebody else a few hours later. And now, about the sixth hour, keep going, keep going, keep going. I need another laborer. Come on. You've been born into the kingdom. You've been baptized in his name, filled with his spirit. And you need to start right here, okay? Keep going. It's the sixth hour. Keep walking, keep walking. Oh, pause. Can we go back a scripture? The sixth hour. Oh, now it's the ninth hour. I need another laborer. Come on. Who's next in line there? Great. You've been born into the kingdom, baptized in his name, filled with his spirit. You've, you've now been hired to do the same work, but you're in the same starting place that your dad was before. Okay, now time goes forward. Everyone keeps walking. We're, we're moving throughout the day. And again, he went out. Okay, next verse. And about the 11th hour, time has gone by. I need one more laborer, two more laborers. Why don't we, have, yeah, there's two more. I see two more left. You're picking up the tail end of the train. We call that the caboose. <laughs> would, you, would you join? All right. Baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. What a beautiful family you have here. <clears throat> oh, go back. I didn't finish reading that one. And he found others standing idle and said to them, Why stand you here idle all day? The rest of your family are such hard workers. You need to work. You, you will. Of course, you work just as hard as everybody else. You clean your room. You do everything your mom and dad ask you to do. Don't answer that right now. <laughs> and they say unto him, because no man hath hired us, he has said unto them, my parents don't give me a good allowance. Brother Kumar, we're going to have to talk about that. Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that you shall receive. Okay, now everybody start working. You're moving forward. Time is going by. So when even was come, as the Lord of the vineyard saith unto the steward, call the laborers and give unto them the hire from the beginning to the last. Okay, pause. This is an illustration of how God builds his church. One at a time, he brings you in, he hires you, and you start working in his field. And so... When even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto the stewards, Call the laborers and give to them the hire, beginning from the last unto the first. Next verse. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Next verse. So let's all gather together. The day's been over. You guys all did a great job. And now, just to be clear, um, the real payment is salvation. Because you accepted the job and you continue to work diligently and walking in the right direction, I'm not going to just pay you a penny. I'm going to give you life eternal. I'm going to invite you to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
I'm going to allow you to miss the tribulation and not have to suffer judgment. The payment that he's talking about isn't, isn't about wages or your paycheck. It's, it's about this gift of salvation because everyone gets the same gift. Yes, there will be rewards at the marriage supper lamb based on what we did in the kingdom of God. That's not what we're talking about here today. What we're talking about is walking in holiness. But when the first came that supposed that they should have received more than they likewise, everyone received a penny. Next verse. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that is thine and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as I give unto thee. It is, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Many be called, but few be chosen. You're going to receive the same reward that he's going to receive, that he's going to receive no matter how long you've been walking this walk with God. The only contingency is that you keep walking. Amen. Let's give him a hand today. Woe well, unto us if we ever start to, in our walk with God towards his holiness, from the same starting point that everyone was born into this kingdom. Woe well, unto us if we ever start to look back and look down. See, it's God who's responsible for the transformation. Yes, there, there are steps that we take, but there are some things that will just not come except time go by, except we mature, except we grow, and some do grow at a faster pace than others, and glory be God. It's not for us to, to decide where you are on the spectrum, on the line, in our marching order towards holiness, but you were holy the moment you were filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in his name and repented at an altar, you have become separated unto him in that day. Are you perfect? No. Are any of us perfect? No. And as we, we walk in that direction, God's spirit, his word promises that we will ever become more like him. We will ever demonstrate a greater degree of his spirit in us, his holiness in us. And so, yeah, there's an expectation, not from myself, not from Pastor Schumacher, but from God that we will ever grow into greater levels of God's spirit in us demonstrated. God wants to reproduce more of himself in you today than was in you yesterday and last week. Holiness is not a destination. Holiness is a direction we walk in. And as long as we have breath, we ought to stay in the place where God can continue to work on us, continue to move in us. And, and as time goes by, the more we walk in that light, the more of God's holiness will naturally show and shine through us. As I shared my testimony last Sunday, um, it was last Sunday, 26 years ago, that I was filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the name of Jesus, that I repented at an altar, and, and all of this was brand new to me. I believed in God and I believed in the word of God, but I didn't know how to live a life. But God opened up a door for this gift of salvation, this truth that all of a sudden now everything had changed. There, there was desires that just dropped immediately, like a light switch. I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there anymore. There was other things that took time. There are things that are still taking time. God is still working in us. And as I shared last week, I know it was Labor Day weekend because it was the picnic the day after I was filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the name, repented at an altar. And, and of course, then I wanted to come spend the time with my new church family. Um, but I, I didn't dress like everyone else dressed. I didn't know what modesty was. I didn't know. I didn't have a concept. But that didn't make me any less saved that day. Because I was set apart, made holy unto God through my obedience to the word of God, through the plan of salvation. But that's just the birthing point. That's the starting point. That's not a destination either. 
if we stay there, we've, we've lost the rest of what God has for us, his will for us. And if the good man of the house, if God had come on that Labor Day 26 years ago, and, and if God had called us up to meet him in the clouds, like the Bible says that he will, on that Labor Day, I would have gotten the same reward that people who had been walking in this way for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years would have gotten. Salvation. My lack of remodeling to that point in time did not disqualify me from being holy, like he is holy. See, we've got this concept in our mind that, that, that it's a checklist of things oftentimes. And then we, we measure ourselves against that checklist, and, and if we know to do good, we ought to do it. But we're all works in progress. We're all working in a direction, and it's the power of God working in us that actually gives us the ability to become holy like he is holy evermore. But from that moment of time in which we're born, we are holy, we are separate, we are sanctified, but the sanctification process does not stop. It's the start. There are many denominations that have, have tried to input, implement remodeling programs on people's lives, starting from the outside first, and, and they never work. See, true holiness has to come from the inside. It has to come from a, a God's spirit working in us, his love shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And that, that work will always eventually show up on the outside, but it doesn't show up on the outside necessarily all right away. And if we, at any point in time in our walk with God, as we're, we're moving from the point in which we were born to the point in which we're moving towards his holiness, if at any time we walk off the job, well, we, we're the ones who have separated ourselves from God, not God from us. And the, the Bible says that there will be many in that day that say, Lord, Lord, have we done many wonderful works in thy name? And God will say, depart from me, ye work of iniquity. You had a chance to receive my promise of salvation, a guaranteed of success, if you just continued walking, but you walked off the job living a life that wasn't separate unto me. No holiness, no reward. Did you know that this, this Pentecostal movement that we're privileged to be a part of was actually born out of the holiness movement around the 19, around, that started in around the 1800s and then came to fruition into this experience around the 1900s. Let me give you a brief history lesson. Following the American Civil War, there was many holiness proponents, most of them coming from the Methodist group of, or organization, and they became hungry for revival, and they started to have the, what became holiness camp meetings as the first distinct gathering of, of these believers from different denominations. And history will show us that they convened in a place called Vinland, New Jersey in 1867 under the leadership of what was at the time many Methodist ministers. And this gathering started to attract as many as 10,000 people. Can you imagine back in the day of, before uh, transportation and Google Maps and how to get the place to place, 10,000 people started to gather together for what? For a holiness camp. At the close of the encampment, while ministers were on their knees in prayer, they, they formed the National Camp Meeting Association for the promotion of holiness and agreed to conduct a similar gathering the next year. The second National Camp Meeting was held at Mannheim, Pennsylvania, and drew upwards of 25,000 people from all over the nation seeking what? Holiness. These camp services became legendary for the spiritual power and influence that was felt in them. These people were certain that a holy God was looking for a holy people. And as they reached towards a holy God, it was in the early 1900s, that same movement, that same group that had been starting to gather together, the holiness people, started to experience a new kind of power, the power of Pentecost. As God poured out his spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, this truth was born out of holiness. There's no separating holiness from truth. Take away the holiness and you simultaneously take away the truth. Now today, there are thousands of denominations that associate themselves as Christian faith. They say they believe the Bible and that Jesus Christ is their Savior, but when you read the what they believe statements, you will be hard-pressed to find many that point to anything that says holiness. And while... The, this, is, this truth isn't exclusive to a single organization because there's many groups, oneness, spirit-filled denominations that uh, have the same truth that we have. 
If we go back in her church history around this, the turn of the 19th century when God poured out his spirit like he did in the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles, California, from that birthing place, there's many groups that we can draw lines to, including ourselves, that denominations with a variety of names, most of them coming from what was then the holiness movement. And today there are some that still actually consider themselves part of that same holiness movement. And we could probably ascribe ourselves to that. We are a holy people. Are we not? But outside of our own movement are those other groups that are oneness, spirit-filled. Groups like the, the Wesleyan University of Indiana uh, it still falls under the banner of holiness. And I have an article that I'd like to read that was written by a minister named Keith Drury who teaches there at the Indiana Wesleyan University. Again, this is speaking of the holiness movement. And the title of his article, written by this holiness minister and teacher, is The Holiness Movement is Dead. He writes in his article, I owe a lot to the holiness movement. My grandparents raised my father, who became a holiness preacher, and now I, I follow in that path. But the holiness movement as a movement is dead. Yes, I recognize there are many wonderful holiness people around and people are still getting entirely sanctified here and there but the, as a movement I think we need to admit we're dead we have a holiness heritage and we have a holiness denomination we have a holiness organization we have holiness doctrines we even have holiness colleges but we no longer have holiness as a movement he asked himself what is the cause of its death and he suggests eight factors which contributed to the death of the holiness movement as he knew it. Number one, he said, we wanted to be respectable. Holiness people got tired of being different and looked on as holy rollers. We shuddered at the thought of being a peculiar people and we'd be determined to fit in. Number two, we plunged into the evangelical mainstream. Gradually, the theology among our people became the same generic evangelical soup served at other evangelical churches, and holiness people actually became evangelical people. It's hard to have a holiness movement when our people are, are really part of the evangelical movement. Number three, we failed to convince the younger generation. We failed to preach the importance of sanctification. At best, holiness is preached as an attractive accessory and not an essential necessity. Number four, we quit making holiness the main issue. When the holiness movement was a movement, holiness was the main thing. Holiness was the, all ten of the top ten priorities. Everything else was brought into line behind holiness. Number five, we lost the lay people. The real movement is not made up of professionals, but of those that are part of the congregation. We no longer have a, a force of foot soldiers. We have generals without armies. We have a strategy, but no one to execute it. Number six, we overreacted against the abuses of the past. This may be the same overreaction that Nicholas and the doctrine of the Nicolaeans had. Some, perhaps, he writes, in the old holiness movement were legalistic and judgmental, and in the past we would have never touched, been able to touch the world, but as we became assimilated into the world, we now seldom touch God. Number seven, he says, we, we adopted church growth thinking without theological thinking. Most of us in the holiness movement, myself included, joined the church growth movement with great gusto. Pastors became CEOs, ministers became managers, sermons became talks. Sinners were renamed seekers, and programs became the new way to get deliverance instead of at the altar. Number eight, we did not notice when the battle line moved. While we have been meeting and talking to each other about holiness, discussing doctrine and holding conferences, the battle line has moved on us. Many of our people do not need to be sanctified because they have not yet been saved. The doctrine at risk in many holiness churches is not sanctification but a conversion to start the sanctification process. The writer goes on to say, my sense is that we are dead as a movement. And the irony is, there has seldom been a time when the church more desperately needs this holiness message more than now. <laughs> the 
if our musicians would come as we turn to our last scripture in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Church, God has guaranteed our success if we will just simply walk in the light. If we will start from where we started and move in a direction towards him, in our steps of obedience, it will always reproduce more of him in us to a degree that makes us want to be more obedient and conform all the more. It's a virtuous cycle. It feeds itself. The more we walk with God, the more we want to walk with God, the more we walk with God. The more we obey his word, the more we see the blessings of our obedience, the more we want to obey his word, the more we see the blessings. It's it's a virtuous cycle, and it's God's intention to reward us, even in this life, as we walk in the light of holiness. 1 John 2, verse 3 says, And hereby we do know him, Here's the guarantee. If we keep his commandments, well, how do I keep his commandments? I'm not equipped to be that obedient. Well, you have to start walking in the light towards holiness. You have to be born again, born of the water, born of the spirit, repent, and then become obedient. As you become obedient, here's the evidence that your obedience is real obedience. You will start to keep his commandments, and then you will keep more of them, and then you will keep more of them, and then you will ever become more aligned to the word of God the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us and became the chief cornerstone, the example of which, which we pattern ourselves in. <laughs> he guaranteed that that will happen. Not that we will ever be perfect. We're not ever going to be God, but we're going to ever become more like God. Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, the image and the name revealed in us. And hereby we do know him. We have this guarantee we know him if we keep his commandments because his spirit always works. He saith, I know him. He that saith, I know him. I know God. I, I, I serve Jesus and keepeth not his commandments is a liar because his spirit always works. And the truth is not in him, but whoso keepeth his word, whoso taketh steps in obedience, whoso moves in a direction from where they started towards God, verily is the love of God perfected because perfection is not a destination, it's a direction. Hereby, we know him because we progress, we grow, we mature. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to what? Walk, even as he walked. God's promise to each and every one of us is that if you start moving in the right direction, he will give you the power to take the next step. And then another one. And then another one. And he is so patient. He is so long-suffering. And he knows we're not perfect. We're filled with flaws and that we're prone to failure. And yet he prepaid the price for all of our sin, no matter how big or small, that we could come to be a part of his kingdom, to be hired as laborers into his field. And, And No matter where you're at in the process, as long as you're in the process, you are wholly separated unto God as long as you continue to walk in the direction. The Bible even says, if you do this, you will never fall. If you'll walk in the Spirit, if you'll move, here's a guarantee. This morning, if you'd stand with me, we are all at different places in our walk with God and our commitment and our understanding and our ability to conform to his word based on our past obedience as God gives us the will and the desire to do things that we never wanted to do before. And as I look back on my own life, as I, as I reflect on my own <laughs> successes and failures, I can see where God has continually continually built up himself in me to greater levels. 26 years ago, I started this journey. I can't say I was always walking in the right direction, but when I got off course, God allowed me to repent and to get back on track. He, he's, he's for us, church. He's, he's for you. He's, he's guaranteed success, but he can't make you do it. You have to choose yourself to, to stay on the right path, to move in the right direction. Not that you will be perfect, but that when you fall, that you will simply confess and say, God, I, I screwed up again, but I, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to move in the right direction. 
you're here today because you're taking a step in the right direction. You're, you've already demonstrated that to God just by being here. And so no matter where you're at in your journey, as we open up this altar this morning, we can come, we can start, we can take the next step, we can repent, we can do whatever God has put in front of us as long as it's towards his holiness. Would you come this morning? Oh.